Good afternoon and welcome to the Hudson Institute and today's event on the coming clash or continuing clash between the Western powers and the IAEA and Iran and its continued pursuit of nuclear weapons. Uh, the issue has come to quite a uh, urgent point and we're privileged again to be talking about it today with two of the world's foremost experts in uh, nuclear, pro nuclear production, nuclear weapons, and certainly inspections and, and in Iran and in this process. David Albright is uh, the head of ISIS, the good ISIS, as it's become known, uh, and the author of a recent book called Iran's Perilous Pursuit of Nuclear Weapons, which has uh, gotten enormous praise and is available on Amazon for just like five or six dollars in the electronic version. And, uh, <clears throat> and Oli Heinonen, who is at the Stimson Center and is uh, one of the world's foremost experts in all these issues and was deputy director of, uh, of the IAEA itself. And, uh, and today is, uh, is again at, at, at the Stimson Center and provides the, the community with his insights and, uh, and his commentary. And we're grateful to have them both with us today. Uh, just briefly, I, I just say that, you know, that we, it's been a few weeks since we've, you know, I've had the chance to speak to you both and the, the community has had a chance to hear from us. Um, you guys did make some public remarks ahead of the uh, most recent board meeting and, and the draft and the or the report that was circulating. And we can relate to that in a minute. Uh, but prior to that, it had been some time uh, since there'd been any public uh, discussion of this because the, the June meeting of the uh, quarterly meeting of the IAEA passed uh, without much fanfare. Uh, the international community again pulled back on any resolution of concern about Iran's continuing violations or uh, it's continuing stonewalling in other areas, even a conditional, I think, resolution. And, and, what, and then maybe you'll remind me whether that was first brought up in, in, the, in the last year in the fall or in the spring of this year and then tabled or what. So the Iranians managed to, it seems to me, attain another two months of space since, uh, since then, uh, leading up to September's meeting. Uh, the September meeting took place I want to talk to you guys about where we are, what's happening, what could be next, what's going on, um, and what what the why why so many people say we're at such a critical juncture. You know, David, you've talked about the fact that in, you know as a result of what we learned in June that that the Iranians could could produce uh, enough ninety percent material for a weapon in less than a few weeks with just one cascade. They could be doing that right now since they have we're not able to see exactly what they're up to. Uh, these ambiguities are growing. Oli, you've, again, you've talked about the, the concerns about the, the broader nature of un, un, the inability to get at and access so much of this infrastructure that exists and, and the ambiguities that remain with that Grossi is talking about with the missing uranium and these things. All of this is troubling. And then on top of it, it looks like after this meeting, while there had been some tentative agreement to allow inspectors access to certain, uh, to swap the recording mediums in certain cameras, not necessarily to, to see the footage that had been taken over the past six or eight months, but to swap the recordings. Um, there has now been a hiccup in that agreement in which Iran now denies access to a particular important area of the production of centrifuges. It says it's not part of the agreement. Grossi says it is. Again, that meeting passed. It allowed Iran to, to get this uh, uh, semi agreement and re relieve some pressure. The Allies did not apply any uh, resolution to refer Iran to the Security Council, which would create the basis for the pressure that has been effective in the past. And Iran now is in a position to expand its arsenal, or whatever you want to call it, uh, over the next period until we get to our next negotiations, which are December. If, if have I have I laid that out basically correctly, David? Well, the yeah the the Board of Governors after this in the September meeting, chose not to pass a resolution. I mean, both Ollie and I recommended that that resolution was needed, um, that it, it was time to, to really move this thing forward to another level um, to get Iran to take this, this whole question of inspections more seriously. Um, that advice clearly was not followed and and, and Iran, in essence, was able to use what's been a very successful tactic is, is that it gets rewarded for being willing to meet or being willing to negotiate absent any substantive progress. And so you watched another board of governors meeting go by where the opportunity was lost. And then this one, this case is worse because what Grossi thought he had achieved, namely 
and access to the Courage centrifuge manufacturing site in order to, to install or reinstall cameras or make sure they're working, so at least a record would be kept, Iran said, no, we didn't agree to that. Grossi sticks very firmly to the view that he did. And, and, and the Courage site is very important because it's where Iran makes advanced centrifuges. And that's, those are the ones of most concern today because they can produce so much more enriched uranium than the first generation higher one centrifuges. So the hope is that the board of governors will meet and then pass a resolution or make a statement condemning Iran. I don't know if that'll take place. I think it should. Um, and we'll just have to wait and see. Meanwhile, Oli, the Iranians have already amassed enough 60% enriched material that they could up enrich it to 90% for a nuclear weapon in just a matter of weeks. And they could be doing that out of the view of inspectors in the West at the moment. So the fact the, uh, that the Board of Governors took a pass at any resolution creating pressure this time seems to give the Iranians more time to make more material and advance their process, which creates, I would think, a, a concern for the parties who don't want to see them be able to sneak out or break out. What, what do you, what is, what, what, what are the prospects of danger? What, are, what kind of zone are we in now that should concern people, do you think? Or is that a loaded question? I don't know, sorry. I think that we are going to have more and more unknowns as a result of this, that the IAEA is not able to exercise the routine monitoring, which was agreed uh, in the JCPOA and partially is also part of the comprehensive safeguards agreement implementation. And I see three areas where we have now a problem. Certainly much of the focus is in this fabrication of centrifuges in cars and the fact that the monitoring has been uh, stopped and the IA has not been able even to go back and replace the damaged equipment, put it to watch the right place, and put the new cards to memory cards to the computer. This is an important thing because they are manufacturing advanced centrifuges. We have no number since last February, how many has been manufactured, which type, and where they might be today. This is one thing. Oli, I just on that point, for just for folks who are not experts in the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, the Iranians were make, yeah, had IR1 centrifuges and then, then IR2s. Now we're, they're up to IR6, and the agreement allows them to begin using those things in small numbers, and then IR8s. Can you describe why, this, why they're being able to work with these centrifuges, even if they're not producing nuclear weapons with them right now? Is it a, why is it a problem? First of all, it's a problem that uh, they have been developing and they are mastering the technology of more advanced centrifuges, which may have six or nine times uh, more uh, separation power as the IR ones. So, so they're when faster. Have, yes, when you have one cascade of IR sixes, it's maybe six times uh, more than, or it equals six IR one cascades. So you are much more effective and efficient on that. But we lost a lot of other things. And you know, I want to point that one out. It, it gets forgotten on this debate. First of all, you know, Iran is producing yellow cake in uh, Sakan mine and Ardakan. These were also places which are sub were subject to monitoring under the JCPOA. So IAEA has not been able to see in last half a year the production of yellow cake on those places. In the last few years, they have been able to produce 50 tons yellow cake every year. If you take that 50 tons and you turn it to nuclear weapons with the modern technologies, it's enough feed material maybe for uh, five to seven, eight nuclear weapons. This is now an uncertainty which is there on the stocks where they are, and this is something you really can't recover afterwards if the surveillance has failed on those places. So this is so good to keep in our mind. Okay, let me, let me add, I mean, I was sketching out a, a whole range of kind of irreversible gains and, and you know, learning how to make 60% enriched uranium, which is 99% of the way to 90% enriched uranium and weapon grade. Um, they're 
they're learning to make that 60% use, using advanced centrifuges in new ways that they didn't know about before. They're, they're making enriched uranium, 20, near 20% 20 enriched uranium metal, which they um, need if they're going to, a technique they need if, to hone if they're going to make nuclear weapons. Um, Holly mentioned there's lots of centrifuges that could have been produced we don't know about anymore. Um, and you have a, a, a set of things that are happening that, that are irreversible that make it almost impossible to get back to a, a nuclear deal that would have a 12-month breakout time on. Um, it, it will not delay Iran in the ways that were expected or promised by the original deal. And so we're at a place now where if you go back to the JCPOA without additional steps, you're going back to a weaker deal because of the gains Iran has had. And so you do have to start thinking about what compensatory steps are necessary, um, or is it necessary just to move on to a new strategy um, that sets, moves beyond the JCPOA? So one of the things, David, listening to what you're, to what you're saying is, is, uh, is alarming to a degree because the, the, if the agreement was intended to hold them back, and the sanctions have been effective in, in, in pu pushing their economy to the brink and their society as it riots, you know, and they've got a difficult domestic situation. Um, and yet the administration seems to be giving them some breathing room with you know, selling oil to Lebanon and doing other deals and, and, you know, these various things. And yet at the very same time, the Iranians, it appears to me based on what we're, I'm reading and what I'm hearing from you, making it more difficult for the globe, for the world to ascertain the truth about what's taking place there. And it sounds like there are increasing concerns that their uh, declared facilities are just one part of the larger nuclear infrastructure in Iran, which I wouldn't, maybe it's not a parallel program, but they're see, if they're mining uranium ore out there and it's enough for as many bombs as, as Oli is describing, you take that and you make uranium hexafluoride, where is it? Where are they doing, you know, where is the uranium metal? Where are all the things that produce these traces of uh, uranium that appeared at these, at several of the sites we now know about, we didn't before, uh, the, the nuclear archive came out and, and they were there. And then the other 12 to 14 sites that haven't been inspected. Is, is that a concern? Is there a parallel? I mean, is there, is there a whole other infrastructure out there we just don't know, can't find, don't know about? Can I say a couple? You know, in my view, the biggest achievement from the Iranian point of view is that they got the international community to tolerate their non-compliance. This the buck is pushed from one board meeting to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, and no resolution to those questions which were raised last year, for example, in uh, a June board meeting when they adopted the resolution. And if you don't mind, I quote that the resolution so that people know what was agreed a year ago by the IAEA board. It says, reaffirms Iran shall cooperate fully and timely manner, echoes serious concern that no access to two locations clarify questions related to possible undeclared material and nuclear-related activities. On top of that, many states said in their uh, June statement 2020 that if Iran doesn't act quickly, which means the next board meeting, which was scheduled for uh, September last year, they will ask an extraordinary board meeting to address the issue. And now we are one year plus later and no action other than pursue Iran in some statements to comply, but not anymore this hard, clear requirement, which was in June board uh, resolution of 2020. So Iran has been able to turn the play table. And on top of that, if you look now the debate there, it's not only access to those cameras. They are challenging the IAEA interpretation on the particle results, this uh, undeclared uh, uh, uranium particles, where they come from. For one location, they say, we have no explanation, we have no idea where it comes from. Even though if we look the composition of the particles, they are pretty much 
similar which were in 2003 from the, some of the equipment. There may be new ones, we don't know because IAI has not disclosed the information. And the other ones, they say that we have given an answer, but you know, IAEA doesn't accept them and there's nothing we can do. And board NIMS seems to be quite relaxed on that and is now focusing on this uh, surveillance issue only. But you know, this is also credibility for the IAEA verification system. If you have a hard resolution a year and a half ago, how you can be so relaxed today when at the same time you see more yellow cake produced, more centrifuges produced, uh, more uh, high enriched uranium and higher levels enrichment. And then comes the uh, fourth part which people conveniently forget. And this is what you said. What we know about the nuclear program, they suspended the implementation of code 3.1 of the safeguards agreement or subsidiary arrangement which means that they don't provide information in advance of any new developments and changes as they were supposed to provide under the JCPOA. This also adds to the unknowns and unpredictability what, what we have on the table. So one should look this in a big picture and not concentrate to one single item like a memory card or uh, one camera in one of the installations. We have a much bigger problem. So, you know, I'm, 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 reminded, just, yeah. I'm reminded by Yuli's comment that the G7 also made a similar remark. Uh, it, it was just before the switch of government in Iran. And they, they, they said that part of their quote also is, 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 is in the joint commitment ensuring that Iran will never develop a nuclear weapon and ensuring the exclusively peaceful nature. And this is what really made Iran mad to ensure full and timely cooperation with the Atomic Energy Agency. And that statement was met with unusual hostility by leadership in Iran when Rouhani responded the, the following day that they could move their enrichment from 63% to 90% at any day or any hour, he warned. How do you interpret that response, David? Well, I, think it, I think they're, they're moving in, as Ali said, into an area where they have, there's more unknowns, there's more ambiguity. And, and to just add a little bit of context to these centrifuge numbers, I mean, during the JCPOA, there were, you know, several tens of advanced centrifuges in operation. Um, they're now almost 2,000, and they're planning to have 3,000 within months. What number? And, uh, what, and, which, which versions? Um, I'm sorry? Which what, versions, IR4s, IR IR6s, IR2Ms wow. um, are the principal ones. And so you, you have a program that, that is expanding. And when you talk about production, you're always going to produce more than you deploy. And so there could be uncertainties of 20, 30% um, in, in how many they actually have made based on looking at how many they've deployed. And, are visible and without to, seeing in the Natanz in the plant, they could be diverting material out of there at any time to any other cask, you know, that, well, right? I don't think they could divert material. Most of the sites we've been discussing are under I right. inspections. I mean, where they make the highly enriched uranium, the 60%, where the advanced centrifuges are deployed, those are under active inspections because they're holding nuclear material uh, that's subject to safeguards. The uranium at the uranium mines is not material subject to safeguards, and so it, it's 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 not easier as to move as yeah. well, but yeah. or known about. But I think there's also a whole. I I think talk about it in the book Iran's perilous pursuit of nuclear weapons. There's a whole another set of activities associated with actually building nuclear weapons that may be out there, and involve personnel, active or inactive, but ready to go. And, and that's barely known to the IAEA. It knows the past because it has the nuclear archive, but it doesn't know the present. And so Iran has been absolutely um, adamant in not cooperating with the IAEA on questions that get at this uh, area of what's going on in the nuclear weapons program today. Now, I'll really, in David's book, he, he that considerable amount is going on. In David's book, he, he he goes in great detail through the research about what the archive tells us about how the nuclear weapons building and development program wasn't 
dismantled, so to speak, and turned off. It was reapportioned, if you will, into other various places. In your experience, um, this, does the fact that Iran kept these folks employed over a period of 20 years in related disciplines, but under different, under different guises, does that tell you that they've abandoned the, the, the desire to build nuclear weapons or that they're, they're, that they're keeping these folks fresh or that they're actually doing some of these things in certain places? How do you read that? Yeah, it depends uh, how you really read the Iranian documents. And there was a very interesting memo in that material from 2003 when the program was, Ahmad program was put on hold. It was not terminated. When they said that, you know, people will be assigned. First of all, they had to document everything what they have been doing, make it, file it, dismantle the equipment. And then uh, those activities which are telltale stories, those will be suspended. And then they can maintain their skills under what they called overt programs, go to some other institutes and continue research. And if you look today, many of these uh, people, some of them in a very leading positions on universities, are probably doing some research which could be related. And now the IAEA has very limited access because it could go based on Edison protocol, ask complementary access, but that has not been able, hey, they have not been able to do it for a, quite some time. They need political it, support for that, Ali? Well, people, this is a very interesting because as I said earlier, the international community has learned in the last couple of years a very bad habit. It started to tolerate non-compliance. If you look at the pattern, that I picked up that uh, resolution from last year, which was quite, quite important, and there was no follow-up for that and relaxation. And one reason probably are these negotiations when people think that, you know, if we make some resolutions, Iran will not come to the negotiating table. Sure, it will have an impact, but uh, that's why the diplomats are there that they mitigate the consequences and uh, create alternative ways to continue the discussions. That's what they are paid for. Uh, it's, interesting, they, Oli, it's interesting also that in the past, my experience has been that when the Iranians really put the, get the screws put to them, then they end up coming to they end up coming to deal with to talk. You know, they, they say they won't, but if they're in, if the Security Council is going to pass a resolution that's going to affect them, they're going to show up. That's that's true. There's a saying I think for, uh, here in the U.S. that there has been many things which have been stated being impossible before they were done for the first time. Or the third. David, so what I, do you think, what, what do you, as you look at the situation we're in, uh, and, and we've got about half our time here to go, what are the dangers that, that are ahead now? What, what are the things that could be taking place that we ought to be really on guard about? The administration seems to be taking a bit of a lackadaisical approach. Is it time for Congress or others to begin to, uh, to lay out timelines to, enge to engage on this problem? What, what are the challenges and what are some of the policy remedies do you think that could, that could address them both, to both of you? But David, maybe you first. Yeah, I think one is, is that I, I think when you look at what Iran's doing now is, is that it, it appears to be trying to make as much progress as it can on advanced centrifuges and to practice breaking out. I mean, it's, it's doing the kinds of things that they would need to do if they want to break out and build nuclear weapons. And, and it's in their interest to reduce that time. Um, and I think that's what they're doing. And, and they're also learning of how they can push against the will of the Biden administration, uh, the will of the European Union, and make significant concessions and be and and cheat even more and get away with it. And so I think it is time now that that Congress does get more active. I mean, it's always been a leading voice in kind of drawing the line on Iran. And I think it's time that Congress probably have to be led by Republicans with support of, of some of the Democrats, it's time they start looking hard at what exactly has been going on. I mean, this isn't a, a fiasco at the level of Afghan, the pullout of Afghanistan, but it's starting to approach that. You have Israel making threats that all the red lines have, have been crossed by Iran. We're going to do things. So you have an increased risk of military confrontation. Uh, you have 
diminished effectiveness of sanctions and you have negotiations, even if they resume the way they've been developed and the way the United States has approached it, is you'll get a much weaker deal if you allow the negotiations to move forward without modifying them and adding in actions or steps that compensate for all the Iranian gains. So I think it, it is time to, for Congress to start weighing in and, and, and moving to pass laws that, that um, would create um, pressure on the administration to toughen its stance and send a signal to Iran that the time of, of increasing its cheating and, and um, moving forward in its nuclear program will carry some additional risks. Yeah, and especially since they have the design for their own indigenous nuclear weapon, they can be mounted on a missile and they're rather they were misses the fuel, right? I mean, that was the, the point, that's what you discovered in the archive in the book. Uh, Oli, where are we? Same question for as I gave you, David. Where are we and where should we go here? What's, what's up? Uh, I much agree what uh, David said. And I would just add that uh, perhaps the Congress needs also when it pushes the administration to emphasize the need to build the international coalition to implement these new measures and push Iran back to the negotiating table and really uh, negotiate a durable agreement. And I see some positive signs, uh, for example, in Russia. When you read carefully their statements a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Yabkov, who is the uh, vice foreign minister, uh, expressed his uh, dissatisfaction on Iran's uh, enlistment to higher levels and the threats made. So this is a clear sign that the Russians are starting to think that this may get out of hand. So I think that that's one, and then certainly always China. I know it's a bit difficult under current circumstances, but I think that there is also at one point of time a uh, problem for China, particularly if there is any conflict, because this will immediately show up on oil prices. And this is where Chinese economy is vulnerable. So there are ways and means to do it, but someone has to lead it. And Europe is not the one. Do you think that to sort of to, to David's earlier point, maybe picking up on some of the things that you're saying, it is time to sort of go back to the drawing board and to maybe say to the Iranians, you know what, we gave it our best college try here and we, we don't see a way to get to this kind of agreement. So we, we want to we want to, uh, to reach an agreement where uh, it'll result in no domestic enrichment and no domestic reprocessing but a regional program or something that involves the other vested parties, maybe the Chinese and the Russians who can make the money a lot, you know, by, by building a regional facility in Jordan. I mean, what, what, what point do we need to be, to just really go back to, and, you know, seeing this as both a threat to global proliferation as well as um, seeing Iran become a nuclear weapons power? Well, I, think I, it, I, I, I think you could wait. I mean, one of the things that, is necessary in the in the short run is to is to for for the U.S. and and EU to realize that they if they want the JCPOA back they're going to have to get Iran to make um, compensation. Um, Iran always screams that somehow they want compensation for sanctions, but that will happen if they get sanctions relief. Um, if the United States goes back and negotiates the status quo or the old JCPOA, they get a much weaker deal. And so it's it's there's an imbalance that that is that exists. And 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 I think the United States has to face that they're going to have to ask Iran to do things like destroy all these new advanced centrifuges. How truly about ship, account how about, David, how, about, how about ship the 60% material out of the country? That well, that, remove... that, would, that goes without saying. That would that they would be diluted or or um, shipped out of the country. All the enriched uranium they produced, that would that goes without saying. That would be accomplished, and I think Iran would agree to it. What it doesn't want to do is agree to the things necessary to make up for its irreversible gains, and and to compensate for those. And a a two or three year moratorium on advanced centrifuge R and D would, is perfectly called for. They've just had two years. Um, or, or maybe even more. We don't know what they did in secret um, uh, of advancing their, their, their advanced centrifuge program. So a moratorium makes sense. And so I think those are the kind of issues that the people who want the JCPOA are gonna have to 
have to face and accept. There is no going back. Right. There's too much water under the bridge. We can't go, we can't recreate the situation that existed in 2016. Even Biden's There's statement at the UN, right? Even, even Biden's statement at the UN General Assembly last, last month when he said, we'll go for like for like, that's not, that's not real anymore. So Oli, when is it that you think that the, that, the, that the world powers need to recalibrate this policy and ask themselves, what is it we need to do to get Iran to accept a supply of nuclear fuel for its program rather than be the production house for its fuel? I think that we should learn the lessons now, and not only Iran. Look North Korea, look the agreed framework, look the North-South Declaration in 1991. The declaration said there would be no reprocessing and no enlistment in Korean Peninsula. One year later, Safe Gas Agreement uh, uh, enters into force. Reprocessing plant is there. Plutonium production uh, is there. Two years later, they start the uranium enrichment because this declaration was never implemented and US was part of it. US was actually the only one who did something and pulled the tactical weapons away from uh, Korean Peninsula. Then you look at the six party talks and the, what happened with the Fool's Day Agreement. Similar problem because in all cases, the tools were left in place to do enrichment, to do reprocessing. So this is our dilemma here. So what is now needed is a great bargain. Say, look, it's not time to enrich dear friends in Iran. If you don't do uranium enrichment during next number of years, this is what you are going to have. I would not think that it's a very good idea to put a regional enrichment plant there. There's enough enrichment capacity in this world, but assurances for them that there will be nuclear fuel, it will be deliver delivered with certainly one condition that the country is in compliance with its international undertaking, nuclear undertaking, that should be there. And then in return, something very different, something which the Iranian people would like to have, not the administration, the people, because the change comes from there. If there's enough pressure, they will perhaps give up uranium enrichment and will have fresh water in uh, northern part of I Iran. This kind of thinking would be perhaps the way to go, so, and not just to slam one more sanction and uh, wait that uh, you know they get, they will be right. There has been sanctions in Iran. There has been sanctions in North Korea. The only place where they worked was Libya. And again, study why Libya did that thing in 2003 December. This is the way you know one should learn the lessons and not try to take tiny small pieces of JCPOA and massage them and hope that now it, now it works. Mm -hmm. I've heard you talk about, Oli, uh, in, a, in a related subject, that part of the discussion around the, uh, the JCPOA or the, these proliferation concerns needs to expand in terms of delivery vehicles and should begin to, to look at drones as delivery vehicles. Can you just give us a couple words about why you're concerned about those evolutions and, and that policymakers need to begin to be more creative in looking at how the Iranians can or others could be uh, deploying these things? Well, for the nuclear device, we need to remember the payload. It's not very light, it's heavy. So I think that some of the drones certainly have not that capability. So the drone is to do something else, the kind of more conventional attack at, as we have seen on oil refineries in Saudi Arabia or some places in Yemen. So, but this goes to slightly different picture. It's not anymore nuclear only. It's a much wider look on those capabilities. And again, it has to be put into context because honestly, in my view, Iran needs missiles. Every country has right to define, uh, de defend itself. The question is which type of missiles, which kind of ranges we are talking, which kind of payloads we are talking. That's what needs to be agreed. And then similar, similar has to apply in the region, which will be also difficult. So that 
perhaps will alleviate some of the concerns of the Iranian people, those who think strategically and not just from uh, current uh, regime point of view. David, when we, when we talk about congressional measures that you think could help accelerate or provide some bracketing for, for negotiations, what, what sorts of things do you, do you envision? Uh, you know, the resumption of sanctions by a certain time, if, if within a year the Iranians aren't engaged in meaningful dialogue or a deal hasn't been reached, what, what sort of timeline, what, 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 do we, what do you think we need here? Well, it's, it's, I think it's got to go, it's got to be more than, than some of the other pieces of legislation of, of, of creating the sanctions. I mean, on Iran, I mean, one of the, one of the needs is to create a better mechanism of, of imposing secondary sanctions on China. Um, I think that's called for, and the administration is hesitating to do that. Um, and I think it, of course, the administration wants some time to bring China along into a, a kind of a revised grand coalition, but it legislation could aim that if it hasn't been done within six months or some amount of time, that China will face secondary sanctions. So that that would be useful. Um, others would be that 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 get at just what is the administration doing and 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 legislation that could aim that if certain things aren't accomplished by certain dates, that then there's a requirement for, let me just call it a plan B, that there, there's talk about this all over, all over Europe and the United States and in Israel, but what does that exactly mean? I mean, are, are, how are we gonna, if there isn't gonna be a deal and, and we really do have to face that possibility, um, and, it, and any rework deal could be years away from fruition. What are we going to do in the meantime as Iran builds up its capabilities? And I think we're going to have Congress could help make it clear that 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 if Iran crosses, you know, or continues, I would just say continues on the path it's going now, there will be military consequences. I mean, again, I you have to be rather vague about that, and Congress can only do so much on that. But nonetheless they can start to create pressure legislatively that Biden comes out with a very firm statement that, that the United States will not tolerate Iran's continued um, progress on the path it's on today. And, and we all can measure it. You can measure it in multiple ways and it's headed toward a very bad point. Um, other things that short of legislation, I mean, there, there really should be more hearings on this issue. There have been none effectively. There's been some questions raised by Senator Menendez at confirmation hearings, but there's been very little action in the hearings to, the, to draw out just what is the administration planning, what have they accomplished, and what are they gonna do if they aren't able to re get the JCPOA back to even what it was before. Um, many disagree with that the JCPOA is effective, I'm one of them, but. I'm not sure in the current situation they can get anything even remotely like the JCPOA of 2016 in the current environment. They're gonna end up with a much weaker deal. And, and I think people need to be aware of that. And, and I think Congress can, by holding hearings, can bring out and, and let the administration defend its position. If it thinks it's gonna get the best arms control agreement in the world, as it past administrations have liked to say, uh, well, prove it. Oli, how do you see that? What 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 role can you know the uh, the other elements of American uh, politics and power play in influencing the uh, the decisions which the administration makes and which are really the lead the lead decisions in in the process? Or what think, and what kind of pressure points are there? I think it's a Congress which has a say here, and they have to use all all ways and means legislative means which they have. They have budget. They can. Uh, make certain decisions uh, with, the, with regard to using military power. But at the very end, it's also, also us Americans, the normal people. You know, if there is a conflict in Middle East, who's going to pay that? It's we, with our taxes. That's very clear. Certain commodities prices will shoot up and we have to pay for that. So at the very end, 
it's an ordinary citizen, which may have today many other problems. This is just one of them. But I think that's another area where the change may come, particularly in the longer term, and to keep your representatives in the Congress responsible. Ask them to explain what they are doing. You know, it's a it's an interesting question. We have about 10 minutes left in the discussion. And I, I noted that you both have used the word ambiguity uh, in describing the period that we're we're entering. That, 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 that the ambiguity about what Iran is doing and what it's capable of is expanding. And in my experience, that that ambiguity, that lack of clear knowledge, lack, lack of certainty about where they are in their program causes anxiety among key players in, in the region. Now, in, in particular, uh, the Arab states of the region have not pursued nuclear weapons programs for the last 30 years. Well, I presume they all believe that Israel has some nuclear capability. But as Iran has gone forward with its program, they have all started pursuing nuclear weapons. One, at first I asked myself, what is it that they know that we don't? They're not worried about Israel, they're worried about Iran. That's intriguing. But secondly, you know, the, the Iranian program continues to, to move along and it begins, it seems like it's really uh, causing concern in the, in the region there at a higher level than I have seen in recent years. Uh, I spoke recently to a member of the National Security Council of a prior administration who, while he had not had these intimate discussions with his uh, counterparts in the last eight or 10 months, it told me that based on the ambiguities we've talked about, the kind of amount of material possessed by Tehran, the lack of international insight and inspection into what's taking place in their facilities and, and what, what, what they could be doing and the duration of that, of that uh, ambiguity uh, puts folks in a very awkward position in, in, in let's say, you know, Israel. And, you know, I might put the likelihood that something could happen to try to disrupt the Iranian program at, at a 75, 80% number in the next period of time. Uh, that isn't the core of our discussion, but as you look at this situation, do you think that, that in addition to the diplomatic and legislative efforts that are out there, we could be approaching a period where Israel just can't tolerate the kind of ambiguity you're describing? I think they've made that clear. I mean, Israel's prime minister spoke in front of the UN. Um, he made it very clear that, that they're losing patience and they are planning actions. Um, obviously, covert and and destructive actions. So I, I think who knows what they're capable of. It depends on the assets they have in country and and um, and their own political will and decision making. But I think we're, we're entering a period of time where the inaction by the Biden administration is leading Israel to take actions to set back the Iranian nuclear program. I mean, they Iran could, be, could have been making many more advanced centrifuges if Israel, assume it's Israel, hadn't taken out a very large advanced centrifuge assembly facility at Natanz um, a year and a half ago and hadn't bombed or had a drone strike on the Courage centrifuge manufacturing facility that probably set them back a couple of months. And so, and you've had other actions by Israel. Now, that's not, a, that's not a policy in the interest of the United States. It's a policy because we're failing to come up with a solution and we're harking back to better days, the golden days of the JCPOA when those days don't exist anymore. And it's really time for Congress, the administration, the American people to wake up and realize that Iran is a deep threat. It's on its plan B and it's well into that plan B. And we're not doing enough to prevent a, essentially what could turn into a war in the Middle East, which as Ali noticed is gonna have an impact through oil price increases and other kinds of disruptions on the American people. Well, and it's a war of Iran's creation. No one else's if it comes. Oli, you're up. Yes, thank you. I take it also somewhat differently, this ambiguity. Because when you don't know and you want to bomb, how you can bomb unknown? And how you can make an effective and efficient plan B 
if you don't know entirely. So these are serious questions and you know it's easy to throw out and ask the guys to come with a plan B but may, they may be in a difficult position to make it and then my experience tells me from the past that Iran has also plan C, D and F so it's not a mechanistic exercise at all uh, and the fact that uh, they have been diversifying uh, the production capacity and when they moved at the beginning of the JCPOA, end of 2014, the manufacturing capabilities gradually to the Atomic Energy Organization and related facilities. Many of those capabilities stayed over there in Sheikh, in uh, Tehran, or in Haft Ettir, in Isfahan. They still have the necessary equipment to manufacture centrifuges, so, uh, and missiles, and whatever you want to look. So this is not going to be an easy walk to make that plan B in such a way that it does more than delay the program. Well, there's no question that uh, an effort to to choke off or certain choke points of Iran's program, you know, would be a would be a, a tactical strategic effort, so to speak. But you know, uh, maybe better than nothing. And I would remind us that I, I'm reminded when I hear of these things that the, uh, that, the, that the timeline given for the delay that would be attained by Israel's attack on the Osirak Iraq nuclear facility would be uh, 18 months to two years at the time. And uh, those 18 months or to two years managed to stretch on for an awfully long couple of decades. So you never know. You never know how things these things work out. It's certainly true. It's a danger, but Iran's possession of nuclear weapons uh, seems to me to be far more dangerous uh, in terms of its ability to blackmail, threaten, attack, and change the the, the dynamic uh, of the the that faces uh, the people of the region and the world. Um, uh, any last words and, and predictions here, uh, gentlemen? Yeah, one is I'd like to hear. actually build on something you said. I mean, the Israel destroyed the Osirik reactor in 1981 in Iraq. It, it created a, a reaction in Iraq that led to a massive nuclear weapons effort in the 1980s that went largely undiscovered until after the Iraq war in 1991 and the imposition of, of, of pretty radical inspection arrangement, um, which Ali and I were both familiar with and participated in him much more than I. Um, but it went on discovered. And, and in a sense, the world was lucky to have that, have Iran invade Kuwait and then have the international reaction to kick him out and impose this ins inspection regime. Because otherwise, Iraq probably by now would have an arsenal of 20 to 30, 40 nuclear weapons. So I think it, you have to be very careful that that you can't rely on military options um, with any assurance. And that's why there has to be a much more thorough plan B. And I agree with Ali, everything Ali said, it's, it's very complicated to do and Iran's making it harder to design, but nonetheless, you have to do it. I just think that military options are gonna, are gonna happen as part of that plan B. They're not gonna be an invasion of, a, of Iran, but they're gonna happen. Um, as Israel's been demonstrating, but that's not enough. And if you do just, if it's just Israel out there destroying some facilities, I think you'll end up with Iran having nuclear weapons, if that's the only res response the international community can muster. And I think the, you would have to fault the United States for those nuclear weapons if it does take place, because the United States is in a position to put tremendous pressure on Iran and to offer tremendous incentives to Iran in order to, to prevent that future. Well, we are, yeah, we're entering a dis difficult and challenging days, no doubt, for presidents and, and prime ministers and policymakers of all stripes, as well as those of us in the prognostication and analysis business. You know, there's no question that these are, uh, these are dangerous times and they're important issues. Um, and I think America and all of our allies would be a lot safer in a world in which uh, the Iranians don't have a nuclear weapon. And, you know, as I'm reminded of the discussion, guys, of the last time where so many critics, uh, you know, said it was either let Iran, you know, have this wonderful JCPOA 
and off to the races and uh, you know, or it's going to be a, it's or it's going to be war and and uh, and catastrophe well maybe there'll be you know some some other continuance of the third way that they doubted then that has been able to mow the lawn and keep keep the program um, you know uh, away from its its goal uh, maybe that'll be on a bigger scale maybe it won't maybe who knows but we will be here to talk about it i'm sure of that so thank you for your commentary this morning and i appreciate your insights very much i hope folks on on the hill will will listen and others will will take up the charge and and perhaps we can come back with some with some further ideas and some guests uh, in that regard as well thank you